Welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 1, Tutorial 13 on Accounting for Allowances for Doubtful Accounts. In this tutorial, we will account for allowances for doubtful accounts using two methods, the credit sales approach and the percentage of accounts receivable approach. There are two learning objectives for this tutorial. The first is to estimate allowance for doubtful accounts and bad debt expense using the credit sales approach. And the second is to do the same uh, estimate allowance for doubtful accounts and bad debt expense, but using the percentage of accounts receivable, or AR approach. This example relies on the Cramerica Industries Inc. data, so please download the accompanying file, which contains the data and requirements, so that you can follow along. And we will begin with requirement one, which is to determine the amount that Cramerica will report on its December 31st, 2020 balance sheet for accounts receivable net of allowances for doubtful accounts using the credit sales approach. So in this example, in 2020, the company uses a credit sales approach and then a requirement two for 2021, the company switches over to the accounts receivable approach or the percentage of accounts receivable. The easiest way to deal with these is to keep T accounts for both accounts receivable and the allowance for doubtful accounts. So we begin, as the company started from nothing, there is no beginning balance. So in 2020, the company had credit sales of 840,000. So that goes in as a debit to accounts receivable. During the year, 500,000 in collections took place. Then we are told that during the year, the company had 20,000 in write-offs. So the journal entry to record write-offs is a credit to accounts receivable of 20,000, which is what is happening here and a debit to allowance for doubtful account, 20,000. So if we take into account the 840,000 credit sales during the year, less the collections, less the write-offs, gives us an ending balance in accounts receivable, $320,000. And here's the other side of the journal entry for the write-offs, so the debit to allowance for doubtful accounts for 20,000. The beginning balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts account is zero because the company started operation 2020. And then under the credit sales approach, we can figure out how much of a bad debt adjustment we need by taking our credit sales, multiplying by the estimated rate of default as a percentage of credit sales. So $840,000 in credit sales times 5% gives us 42,000. And that is the bad debt expense adjustment. Now we have to watch out. A common mistake is for students to use total sales, including cash. And that is definitely not what you want. Cash sales are 100% collected. So there's only the potential of default on credit sales. So that's why do not include cash sales, only include credit sales. And of course, the journal entry to record our bad debt expense is debit the bad debt expense for 42,000 and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts for 42,000. And the bad debt expense just sits on our income statement as an operating expense or an administration expense or sales actually would be more related to selling because selling expenses are related to sales. So the bad debt would likely best be classified as a selling expense. Here's a bit of a summary of what happened here. So at the end of 2020, we have an accounts receivable balance of 320. We have an allowance for doubtful accounts balance of 22,000 because the write-offs of 20,000 were debited to the account and then we had a credit of 42,000. Remember that the allowance for doubtful accounts is usually always a credit balance and the receivable is usually always a debit balance. And we can see here how the 20,000 is included in both accounts for the write-off uh, and credit accounts written off impact both accounts receivable and the allowance for doubtful accounts. And we also refer to that as AFDA. Now, the final thing to remember here is that at the end of the year, the ending balance in the AFDA still has to be assessed for reasonableness. And if it's not reasonable, then additional adjustments may be required. It's always important to use some professional judgment and say, well, okay, is the ending balance of 22,000 reasonable given the amount of sales and their previous history and collections, et cetera? In this example, because the company just started, it's very hard to make that determination because there's no history.
And here's a presentation of what we would see on the balance sheet. As a partial balance sheet, as at December 31st, we have our receivable of 320,000 and less the allowance for doubtful accounts of 22,000, giving us a net receivable on our balance sheet of 298,000. So now we will proceed with requirement two, which is essentially to go through the same process and present how much the accounts receivable net of allowances would be, but this time under the percentage of accounts receivable approach, also known as the AR approach. We can begin our accounting in 2021 from where we ended off at 2020. And so this information here, this T account, there's nothing new. This just reiterates what happened in 2020 and it gives us an ending balance of 320,000. Then in 2021, the company had 940,000 in credit sales. So that's debited to accounts receivable. There are collections that took place over the year of 700,000. So of course, cash would be debited and accounts receivable would be credited. And there were $45,000 in write-offs. So the accounts receivable would be credited. And of course, the allowance for doubtful accounts, AFDA, would receive the debit for the 45,000, and we'll see that in a minute. Then during the year, there were some recoveries. The company was able to recover $5,000 in previously written off accounts receivable. The correct approach in dealing with recoveries is first to reverse the write-off. So we have to reinstate $5,000 in receivables. So basically we're going to put that back into the accounts receivable. We're going to debit the receivable and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts. So this reverses the write-off and then we record as the second entry the cash, the collection for it. Two parts, first part the reinstatement and the second part the collection and the recovery. In both cases, if you look at these journal entries side by side, the accounts receivable ends up canceling itself out. The 5,000 is both debited and credited. And really what we have here is a debit to cash and a credit to AFDA. But the correct way to do it is in two steps. Basically for 2021, we have a beginning balance 320,000, credit sales, collections, write-offs, and a reinstatement, leaving us with an ending balance of $515,000. And now we can reconstruct the activity through our allowance for doubtful accounts. Again, as with the accounts receivable, we are starting 2021 with 22,000 uh, ending balance in allowance for doubtful accounts becomes a starting point. As noted, there were 45,000 in write-offs, so the accounts receivable was credited and we're going to debit the allowance for doubtful accounts. And then we have the reinstated accounts receivable, which was the first of the two-part entry. So we debited accounts receivable and credited the allowance. Now here's where things get a little bit different. In the credit sales approach, what we did is we calculated the bad debt adjustment based on the percentage of sales. But in 2021, the company changes its method from credit sales to percentage of accounts receivable. The reason why there's a question mark here is we actually don't know what the bad debt adjustment is just yet. And we'll show you how to calculate it, but it is not calculated exactly the same way as the credit sales approach. So this is a very important slide because it illustrates the difference between the two approaches, essentially. What we have to do is under the percentage of accounts receivable approach, we calculate the ending allowance for doubtful accounts. We do not calculate the bad debt adjustment by taking accounts receivable times a percentage. We're actually calculating the ending balance. And how we do that is by taking the 515,000 in ending accounts receivable, and we are multiplying by 3%. Now this 3% is the estimated percentage of accounts receivable, not of credit sales, okay? Key difference. So the AR approach does not use credit sales in the calculation. It calculates the ending allowance for doubtful accounts. So it gives us what we want in the T account for the allowances. So if we take our 515,000 times 3%, that gives us a desired ending balance of 15,450. Now, once we have the desired ending balance, what we do is we reverse calculate the amount of the bad debt expense to make the AFD account end up with what we want. 
in order to go from 22,000 minus 45 plus 5 plus something, right, that was what the question mark was, the missing amount is 33,450. And so that's the proof of that is down here. So an easy way to go through T counts is to work backwards and work your way up. If we start with the ending balance of 15,450, again, that's what we want, the desired ending balance. And we subtract the recovery, we add the write-offs back, and we take off the beginning balance, this means that the bad debt adjustment should be 33,450. And if you're unsure or you want to make sure that your work is always correct, start from the beginning and recalculate the ending balance. So 22,000 in beginning balance minus the write-offs plus the reinstatement plus the bad debt adjustment, and that should give you an ending balance of 15,450. And the journal entry to record this, the same Accounts are debited and credited. We still debit the bad debt expense and we still credit the allowance. This time the amount is different. So under the credit sales approach, we're calculating the bad debt adjustment. Under the accounts receivable approach, we are actually calculating the ending AFDA and then plugging our account to make it equal that ending balance. This slide is just a little bit cleaner and allows us to track what's going on here. So here's the 45,000 in write-offs. Here is the common account where we see the reinstatement. So again, write-offs affect both accounts receivable and allowance for doubtful accounts, and so do reinstatements. Then if we reconstruct what our partial balance sheet would look like at December 31st, we have accounts receivable of 515, which is the ending balance, less the allowance for doubtful accounts of 15,450, giving us a net receivable on our balance sheet of 499,500. Again, we always want to look and make sure that this account is reasonable. So we apply professional judgment and based on history, previous write-offs and bad debts to determine whether this amount is reasonable. If management determines that that allowance is just simply too high, then it would be adjusted downwards. And if it's too low, it would be adjusted upwards. Now, before we end, I want to introduce a bit of a postscript. In the work we've been doing so far with the percentage of accounts receivable approach, we took the accounts receivable balance, the entire balance, and multiplied by 3%. There is an alternative approach that uses the aging of accounts receivable. In our example, I've changed this just a little bit here, so we could say that in 2022, the company has more clients with accounts receivables ranging between current and beyond 120 days, and so those receivables equal $650,000 in total. To better reflect the age of the receivables, management may want to adopt the percentage of AR approach in estimating bad debts, but instead of basing it on a single percentage, on the entire accounts receivable balance, companies will have different rates, different estimates based on the aging. And of course, this makes sense. So in our example here, if we expect only 2% of the current accounts receivable to become delinquent, but as the aging of accounts increases, so basically the longer it takes somebody to pay, it goes to 60 days, 90, then the likelihood of those customers not paying increases. In our example here, we're suggesting that you know over 120 days, if customers don't pay, that's a fairly high likelihood that they actually won't pay. So the requirement for this postscript is simply to determine the AFDA balance using the aging approach. So it's still a percentage of accounts receivable, but it's a composite percentage based on the value of the aging multiplied by the percentage. We would presume that this data is provided. There's no way for you to calculate this. Uh, usually what happens is a company will have a list of customers with aged accounts receivable, something like that. But in essence, the accounts receivable data would be provided like this. So the total is 650,000 broken out into current 31 to 60, 61 to 90, etc. And typically the dollar value decreases as the aging increases, right? Because you know we're collecting uh, and we don't wanna see a very large number here at the end. Then once we know the total dollar value, here is where we would apply our percentages. So on the data provided, we said current is 2%, 61 to 90, we estimate 12% uh, to, to go delinquent in over 120 days, 30%. Again, this data would also have to be provided.
All we do to calculate the total uh, allowance for doubtful accounts, and again, that ending balance, is simply multiply the aging dollar value times the estimated bad debt amount. So 450,000 times 2% is 9, 125 times 4 percent is 5,000, etc. And when we add those up, this means that the balance in our allowance for doubtful accounts would end up being 24,950. And that's the 2022 ending balance. Okay, time to wrap up with some key points to remember. First, if the credit sales approach is, is used or required, make sure to base the bad debt calculation on the percentage of credit sales not cash sales. Again, common mistake. The sales approach calculates the bad debt expense directly. Second, if the percentage of accounts receivable approach is required, we have to use, and whether it's uh, based on the total balance or an aging, that it doesn't matter, make sure that you calculate the ending AFDA, not the bad debt expense directly. So the ending AFDA is based on the ending accounts receivable balance or the compass for the aging times the percentage estimate of the AR amount. The percentage of AR approach does not calculate the bad debt expense directly. It calculates ending AFDA. And then the bad debt expense is the missing value required to achieve the desired ending AFDA balance. So it's suggested that you use a T account where you have a beginning balance and an ending balance, and if there are any write-offs or reinstatements along the way, that those are factored in the T account, and the number that you need to arrive at the ending balance, that's the bad debt expense. So that concludes tutorial 13 on accounting for allowances for doubtful accounts. We hope you found the tutorial useful.